All right, I am back for part two of this q and I've taken a break, I've been topped up with pie and other carbs and sugars, so uh, let's get into it. The first category of questions are all basically about time management and how I make time for reading, how I read so much while also working a full-time job. Now, this is a question I actually get a lot these days, so I have already planned and filmed a separate video answering this question, which will probably be out shortly after this Q&A is up. So you can look forward to that a little bit more detail. Um, but Avakita and Seema Singh and Nick794 basically all asked this question, how do I read so much? How do I find time to do this as well as other hobbies? And the really simple answer is I prioritize it. Reading is the number one thing that I want to be doing when I'm not working. <laughs> And I find all sorts of ways to work it into my daily routine. If I have free time, the first thing I think is, can I be reading with this time? Seema also asked, um, why science fiction? I don't really know. The genre has always appealed to me, especially since my teen years. And I think it's because in general, I have quite an interest in science and technology and these futuristic things. I think a lot of science fiction has deep roots in the present, and it's just all tangled up together. I think it's fascinating. If you can hear that sound in the background, that's my dog licking her kibble. She's not eating it, she's just licking it. So now fully moving on to the questions about books and reading and reviewing. William Stewart says, my main question would be, how does having a booktube channel affect your reading? Do you read more now or feel pressure to finish books so that you can talk about them on your channel? Are you more analytical when you read than you were before the channel started? So yes, having a booktube channel does really affect my reading. It mainly affects the way I think about what I'm reading because these days, I tend to be thinking about how I'm going to talk about a book while I'm reading it. I'm thinking the whole way through, what am I noticing about this? What would I tell somebody else about this when I have to talk about it? I don't know if it necessarily makes me more analytical than I already was, but it, it definitely affects just the way I view my reading and how I feel in, in the moment while reading something. Um, as for like pressure, I don't really feel the pressure to finish something so that I can talk about it. There are a select few books in my entire reading life that I have forced myself to finish them so that I can rate them. Because I don't, I don't allow myself to rate things on Goodreads unless I've actually read them. So occasionally I may hate something intensely, but I'll still finish it so that I feel justified in venting my hate later. But that is not something I do very frequently. Do I read more now? Hello, Ava. <laughs> um, I've got a dog on my lap now. Um, it's so difficult to tell if my reading would be at this hectic of a pace if I weren't doing booktube. I would say probably yes. I would still probably read so much even if I didn't have a booktube channel. Um, I do occasionally like schedule when I'm going to read certain things so that I'll finish things like right before I do a weekly wrap up. That's probably the closest it comes to feeling really pressured to finish things to talk about them. Emily Pettigrew asked, are there any books you've read where your opinion five years ago is very different from your opinion today or books you think about more than you expected to five years ago? It's pretty rare that I find myself very surprised by a book about how much I think about it afterwards that I didn't expect to. The two that immediately come to mind are The Sparrow by Mary Doria Russell. I really loved that book when I read it, at the moment that I was reading it, but it wasn't until months later that I realized how much it had gotten under my skin. I still think about it today. Um, and then The Sea in Summer by George Turner is the other one. That one I still think about constantly, and I, I read that three years ago, I think. Now, books I've read were my opinion five years ago is very different from my opinion today. This is easier to answer in terms of like childhood favorites. So we're not talking five years here, we're talking about 10, 15, 20 years. And I have been incredibly lucky that a lot of the really old favorite books that I have reread, I still like today. Even when I can recognize the aspects of those books that aren't so good, I still think they're, they're really just overall good books, worth reading, worth even giving to kids today. So 
I think the only books that maybe my opinion overall differs quite a bit actually from when I when I was a kid are the Crestomancy novels by Diana Wynne Jones. A couple of them has some pretty problematic issues with like fat phobia and essentially like I think kind of like abuse of children and stuff like that and I don't think it's truly terrible but it does it does put a pall on my enjoyment of them. I can't be as truly enthusiastic as I was before. Oh, also the Dragon Riders of Pern books. That's another one where I have to be really honest that there are some truly bad things in those books, especially the first couple of books that a lot of people read and I find it squicky today. And I can't disentangle that from how influential those books were on me though, how much I enjoyed some of the very things that today I think are kind of awful. Growing up is difficult. Katie Keith asked, if you could read something again for the first time, what would it be? I would probably go for something really big, like The Lord of the Rings, because my first experience of that, I remember so little about it. Um, if I could experience that for the first time right now, as I am right now, that would be super major. And probably also Wild Magic by Tamara Pierce, which was the first book I ever read by her, and just the introduction of pure joy into my life. <laughs> Katie also asked, do you do any nerdy gaming, like D&D board games, etc.? I don't. I am really not a gamer of any type, which I'm a little bit sad about. It takes me a really long time to get comfortable doing something new, and gaming has always really intimidated me. It's the sort of thing that I would need a lot of practice at, like low-key, no stakes, no competitiveness, just friends or family teaching me how to do it in uh, long sessions, and I don't have people around me on a regular basis to do that with. I recently played Settlers of Catan for the very first time, um, back in September actually. It was one of the games that my sister-in-law brought when she was visiting, and I was like, I could actually really enjoy something like that. I just don't have somebody around me to play in, in person and stuff. Awkward asked a very lengthy question. Um, a question hotly debated over on the Twitter writing community can be summarized somewhat as follows. To what extent should indie authors, as recognition for their greater spectrum of achievements and risks in publishing a book, receive positive discrimination during the review and recommendation process? Um, my response to that is no. I don't think any book, any author, regardless of how it's been published, deserves to be given positive discrimination in a review. That is a really good way for a reviewer to lose the respect and trust of their readers. Don't do that. Don't ask for it. And if you're a reviewer, don't do it either, unless you have a really good, well-thought explanation for why you're going to do that. What I do think that indie published books probably do deserve is reviewing time. I think that there are reviewers out there who will read indie published books and who want to talk about them, and I think they do re deserve to be reviewed and recommended, but the actual content of said reviews, that's up to the reviewer. You can't dictate that. Um, I do think it would be good if more people would talk about indie published books because it's such a, a vast <laughs> treasure trove of stuff waiting to be discovered. Unfortunately, I'm not one of those people. I've got so much on my plate that I don't really have time to go diving into the indie world. Nick794 asks, what are your thoughts on the Lord of the Rings books? Will you review them anytime in the future? So I would like to reread Lord of the Rings sometime <laughs> um, to have a, a better opinion of it now, because I used to say that it was my favorite book ever, even though I hadn't read it in like 15 years and my memories of the actual books versus the movie versions are really thin. So yeah, as for reviewing them, I mean, if I reread them, I'll absolutely talk about them, but probably not like a full-on in-depth review because I'm not a Tolkien expert. 
many other people have done that. I don't, I don't have anything new to bring to the table. AJ asked a really interesting question, actually. Um, what do you prefer more, a standalone novel, a series, or a series that can be read as a collection of standalone novels? Do you feel that a lack of good standalone novels discourages people from trying out new genres? So if I had to just choose one, I would say a series that can be read as a collection of standalone novels. I love a good standalone novel. So many things get dragged out into series with multiple sequels, basically because of, I guess, the money-making potential <laughs> from the publisher's standpoint, maybe not necessarily from the author's standpoint if they have a story they really want to tell. But I, I really love a standalone, but I also love series. Some of the best reading experiences I've had in my entire life have been some really lengthy series. But now that I look back on a lot of those, I realize Things like the Vorkosigan saga, for example, or a lot of the historical mystery series that I've read, they are essentially series of standalone novels. You could pick up any one of those as a bit of an entry point into the series and get a full story. And then you can go on to the other stories in that universe if you want more of the continuation of a character's journey or of the world building and stuff like that. That's something I really, really love. Now, as for lack of good standalone novels discouraging people from trying out new genres, I don't really think that's the case. I can't think of a single genre that lacks really famous, highly praised standalone novels. However, I do think that lack of standalone novels can be a massive mental barrier for people trying to get into a new authors. If an author has a massive backlist, so many books to choose from, or they're really well known for a massive lengthy series that's not a bunch of standalones, that can be really hard to just kind of break that ice with an author. I've had that problem myself where I'm like, I don't really know if I want to start another series, but I really want to try a book by this author. So I think that could be something that people kind of struggle with um, if they're trying to start reading by a new author. Cindy Casey asks, could you read five sentences you like from five different books on your shelves? Chosen at random or not, if not random, maybe by books that you liked for different reasons. Yes, I can. These won't necessarily be single sentences like you kind of specified. I tend to remember entire like paragraphs and lengthy quotes from books that really impacted me. So the first one is actually a phrase from the final sentence in Robin McKinley's The Blue Sword. This is the only last sentence of a novel that I've actually written down. <laughs> I was so swept up in emotion at the end of this book when I was like 14 that I wrote the last sentence down as something incredibly beautiful and it stuck with me. Now, reading this now, most of it does not make sense to me. I don't remember any of the characters mentioned in it, but I do remember this last phrase. They took the children with them. Aaron was followed by Jack and Jack by Harry as the years passed, for Luth was fond of children. And that phrase, for Luth was fond of children, has always stuck with me, and I could not tell you why. Next is the first paragraph of The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. It's only two sentences long, but it's basically one extremely long sentence. So this whole book is about how climate change is even worse than most of us think it is. And I read this first paragraph and then put the whole book down for about three days while I was just mulling over exactly what the author is telling the reader in this. It is worse, much worse than you think. The slowness of climate change is a fairy tale, perhaps as pernicious as the one that says it isn't happening at all, and comes to us bundled with several others in an anthology of comforting delusions. That global warming is an arctic saga unfolding remotely, that it is strictly a matter of sea level and coastlines, not an enveloping crisis sparing no place and leaving no life undeformed that it is a crisis of the natural world, not the human one, that those two are distinct, and that we live today somehow outside or beyond or at the very least defended against nature, not inescapably within and literally overwhelmed by it. 
that wealth can be a shield against the ravages of warming, that the burning of fossil fuels is the price of continued economic growth, that growth and the technology it produces will allow us to engineer our way out of environmental disaster, that there is any analog to the scale or scope of this threat in the long span of human history that might give us confidence in staring it down. It's also an excellent use of semicolons. <laughs> then there is the entire passage from The Other Wind that makes me cry every time I read it. So I will attempt to read it out loud without completely choking up. This is the passage that Tahanu speaks near the end of The Other Wind about what she hopes for when she dies. I think, Tahanu said in her soft, strange voice, that when I die, I can breathe back the breath that made me live. I can give back to the world all that I didn't do, all that I might have been and couldn't be, all the choices I didn't make, all the things I lost and spent and wasted. I can give them back to the world, to the lives that haven't been lived yet. That will be my gift back to the world that gave me the life I did live, the love I loved, the breath I breathed. The next quote is one from Memory by Bujold, which is one of the Vorkosigan novels. This is another slightly sad one, but it is short. Some prices are just too high, no matter how much you may want the prize. The one thing you can't trade for your heart's desire is your heart. And the last quote is an entire poem, which had quite an impact on me as a kid. I first encountered this poem in A Swiftly Tilting Planet by Madeline L'Engle. It took me many years to discover that it's actually a very famous poem. I think it's called St. Patrick's Prayer. The entire thing is not used in this book, but this is the portion of it that is. All heaven with its power, and the sun with its brightness, and the snow with its whiteness, and the fire with all the strength it hath, and the lightning with its rapid wrath, and the winds with their swiftness along their path, and the sea with its deepness, and the rocks with their steepness, and the earth with its starkness. All these I place by God's almighty help and grace between myself and the powers of darkness." I can't remember what the beginning of the poem is, but it's definitely missing from how it's quoted in this particular book. But I loved this poem so much. At one point, I printed it out and pasted it on my wall in my bedroom as a child. I used to keep a printout of it with me a lot as well because it was very comforting late at night when everybody else was asleep and I was scared. Onwards to the next question. Jorge Medina asks, have you read The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan? I have not, and I hate to disappoint all the Wheel of Time fans, but I have no intention of ever reading The Wheel of Time. That series, along with um, A Song of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin, are two big popular fantasy series that are pretty much on my never going to read list because the small tastes I've had of them tell me they are not my kind of thing at all. Scott Vanderwerf asks, what were the first core science fiction books that turned you into an SF fan? And who were your first favorite SFF writers? When I was like 12, 13, 14, those are the years when I encountered my first real like adult science fiction novels that were not for kids. And they were very memorable. Those were The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula Le Guin and The Foreigner series by C.J. Cherry, as well as the first couple of Dragon Riders of Pern novels by Anne McCaffrey. And I am one of those people who calls the Pern books science fiction rather than fantasy. They clearly have a very scientific underpinning and explanation for the entire world. Who were your first favorite SFF writers? I kind of just mentioned them. I mean, if you're talking about adult science fiction, Le Guin, Cherry, McCaffrey. If you throw in like adult fantasy as well, um, probably Terry Pratchett. <laughs> Shannon from That So Poe asks, I'd love to know the book that's been sitting on your mental TBR for the longest. I had to have a good think about this question in advance because I couldn't really think of something that I'd wanted to read for a really long time that I still wanted to read that I hadn't gotten around to yet. And then I realized there is this one book that isn't on any of my actual written down TBRs, but I say it's the book that haunts me 
because every time I finally think, yeah, no, I'm never gonna get around to that, I will encounter a slew of references to it, which makes me interested all over again. Like, I should know what that thing is and why it keeps coming up. And that book is Orlando by Virginia Woolf. Cesar Perez asks, with how many books you read, do you remember much from them? I don't remember everything from every book I read. Certainly that's impossible. I tend to remember more, especially specific details from books that I truly loved and that I was really mentally engaged with while I was reading them. And to be honest, that's only a fraction of what I read, a small fraction of what I read. A lot of the other stuff, it's fun while I'm reading it. Yeah, I enjoy talking about it, but a year after I've read it, I won't remember pretty much anything except did I like it or not. Do you reread your favorites? I'm now getting to the point where I want to start rereading things that I've read for the first time in my 20s. I've, I have this increasing stack of things that I've read as an adult for the first time that I really need to come back to and absorb even more from, and it's really hard to make time for that. I really need to, though. Do you give second chances in case you are in a different place and might enjoy something now you didn't when you were younger? I don't know if I give many books second chances. Um, if I do start reading something and I can just tell right away I'm not in the right mood for it, I don't even consider it as something I've started. I just put it down and I, I'll come back to it and start fresh later. Um, but something I was reading and I really hated it and I actually DNF'd it, probably not gonna come back to it. Tommy Turner asked, who are your top three villains in the fantasy genre? Well, I'm gonna go with a really obvious one, Sauron, the Eye, because, well, that probably had more of an impact on me because of the movies rather than the book, but it's still the fantasy genre, right? Um, and then another one would be Ozorn, who is the villain of the Immortals Quartet by Tamara Pierce. And I came to really kind of like his character in the third book where he fully appears, very spectacularly and elaborately um, appears. That one is the Emperor Mage, and he is actually the Emperor Mage of the title. The third favorite villain would probably be the Lone Power from the Young Wizards series by Diane Duane. I mean, the lone power, that whole side of things is essentially entropy and the slow winding down of the universe and also chaos, I think. And I've always liked the appearances, like the personification that appears of the lone power in that series. D. Hollier asks, do you have a certain place you trust for reviews on books? These days, most of the book reviews I consume and that I trust are from other booktubers. And that's a, at this point, it's a pretty long list of channels that I trust people's opinions and their reviews and stuff. I used to read reviews in Locus, but not really anymore. And I do read lots of reviews on Goodreads, but I don't go to Goodreads for reviews to help me make up my mind. I usually don't read reviews there until after I finished a book and rated it and reviewed it myself. The next category of questions are all about crafts and crocheting. Rhea from the Book Finch asked, we know you like to crochet and have now taken up sock knitting. What are some other crafty skills you would love to learn if time was not an issue? Well, so I think some other people asked a similar question, what kind of like hobby or craft I would take up next? And the answer is probably sewing because it would be very handy to know. I'm not super enthusiastic because I know it'll be a bit painful to learn the basics again, but I will enjoy it once I've gotten back up to speed. But yeah, I think that will be next. There are some things I want to make very badly, so I got a bit of motivation that way. And also I've inherited a sewing machine, which needs to be run on a regular basis to keep it in good condition. So even more motivation. Nicole, who is Dorka Brain, asked, you admirably seem to jump into hobbies with gusto, but they also appear to happen in cycles. Do you go back and revisit past hobbies, or are you still doing them and only vocal about the most current or exciting ones? Yes, they definitely go in cycles. I tend to get extremely intense about whichever hobby or craft I'm really into in the moment, and I'm usually not even doing other things. Maybe I don't multi 
I don't multi-hobby very well. <laughs> Is that a word? Um, so there are some past hobbies that I'll probably never go back to. Um, for example, I used to be really into beading when I was a kid. I had an aunt who did a lot of beading and I really wanted to learn that. I don't think I'll ever go back to it. I gave all my beading supplies away. One past hobby that I think I've already mentioned today that I would like to get back into is conlangs, constructed languages. I would like to get back into more of my, my interests surrounding language and linguistics more. It's a very personal thing that I think I would never really talk about or share. I would be too self-conscious about that. But there are things I used to do a lot, just creating languages, practicing calligraphy, coming up with writing scripts and stuff. They were very soothing and relaxing, and I need more of that in my life right now. My other hobby that's kind of on the back burner at the moment is doing jigsaw puzzles. I love puzzles, but I haven't done pretty much any of them this past year, mainly because I have been so absorbed in crocheting and now learning to knit again. Secundra Beasley asked, how did you start crocheting? And Andrea from Infinite Text also asked, I would like to know how you got started into knitting and how did you start learning it? So I was taught how to knit by my dad when I was about six and my mother also tried to teach me crochet at about that same age. And as I recall it, I really took to knitting, but I never understood how crochet worked. I don't think I actually learned how to do it at the time because I just simply couldn't understand how the stitches were made. Then I stopped doing anything entirely. I didn't do any crafts for many years. And then for some reason, when I was about 19 or 20, I picked up this old like crochet projects for kids book that I had and I just started making an afghan. And I would love to know what was going through my head at that time to make me pick up this, this craft that I had not thought about for more than a decade. And I suddenly really enjoyed doing it. For about eight years, I made an afghan every other year and I really enjoyed it while I was doing it, but then I would just be done for the next 18 months after it was completed. And I think that I started to really get more intense with crocheting and now also with knitting now because I kind of leveled up with my skills with crochet, I suddenly wasn't just a beginner anymore. I could do more advanced intermediate things like making garments and that was really exciting. But also I suddenly had friends, I had peers who were doing crafts as well and I could talk to them about it. And sharing your interests, sharing the things that you're making can make them just so much more exciting to do. That's definitely why I've exploded in my interest with crocheting and, and knitting and such. And the last category of questions are the miscellaneous ones. I wasn't sure where else to put some of these questions. The first question is from Kelsey Fish, and she says, I would be really curious to hear about how you keep track of your book buying or budgeting for book purchases or even just budgeting in general. So in general, I do have an entire spreadsheet for managing my general finances, and it's just, I don't think like double bookkeeping or something like that, where I just plug in each purchase as I make them. I like budgeting to be simple. For book buying specifically, I have a completely separate spreadsheet where I list every book that I've bought, the date, the price, um, the author, the title, whether it's read, unread, DNF'd, or skipped. I could probably even insert a screenshot of it here because it's not like super private information or anything if you want to copy it. I believe in simplicity with my spreadsheets. I don't have anything really fancy or whatever. Um, I tend, like if I need graphs or charts or other information, I will make that when I actually need it rather than having it set up to always be there in my spreadsheet, if that makes any sense. Igor asks, how much closer are you to gifting a review of the Babylon 5 TV series to your loyal audience? Well, I've watched the first three seasons and I still need to check if it's available on Amazon Prime or not because if it's not, I need to go through interlibrary loan to get the remainder of the series. I'm probably not going to do an actual review of it. I've kinda let myself off the hook for reviewing TV shows and movies because I already review everything else in my life that I'm consuming. I need a break from reviewing. <laughs> 
Randy Diaz asks, what's your favorite sci-fi movie trilogy? The only sci-fi movie trilogies I can think of are Star Wars, so if you're asking me if I like Star Wars, the answer is kinda? I mean, I've seen all the Star Wars movies that exist today. Some of them I fast-forwarded through because I didn't think they were very interesting. My favorite science fiction movies are Arrival, absolutely, hands down, my favorite science fiction movie. I also really love The Martian. I think the movie version of that story is actually pretty superior to the book, and I also really enjoyed the book, so that's saying something. Um, and it, for fantasy movies, just throwing that out there, um, I am really fond of a lot of Studio Ghibli movies now. I just recently bought myself a copy of Howl's Moving Castle because I need to rewatch it again. It's so good. <laughs> Brock from Let's Read asks, what is one frivolous thing you do solely for yourself? Painting my nails, Brock. <laughs> I just enjoy doing them for myself and they look good for like a single day and then they start chipping. But like, I think it's pretty frivolous because there's no real reason for me to do it. And I have to actually block out quite a bit of time to do it because you know, like it takes forever to dry and then you can't do anything. So I usually like watch TV or catch up on my watch later list on YouTube while I'm doing my nails because otherwise I wouldn't have any time for it. And Jerry from Onyx Pages asks, do you like dancing? <laughs> if so, what's your favorite song? I don't think I really like dancing, but that's because I don't really do it and I don't think I'm good at it at all. I think you need more spinal flexibility than I currently have in order to, to dance properly. I'm just really skeletally wonky, so no. If I were to dance to a song, now, it would probably be something like Lux Eterna from the Requiem for a Dream soundtrack, or something weird like Kriegsgalder by Heilung, because it has a really good beat. Time Traveling Reader asked, what is your most embarrassing flaw, or what is your superpower slash secret talent? Did I answer this question before? My most embarrassing flaw really is that if I don't want to do something because it makes me anxious or stressed, or I just don't want to, I will try to wheedle my way out of it. And it's, it's a little bit embarrassing to admit that. <laughs> As for a superpower or secret talent, I mean, I really am good at making muffins, so there is that. And the last couple of questions for this Q&A come from Mariam. She asks, do you plan to attend the New Zealand Worldcon? Yes, I have my attending membership and I have booked some hotel rooms. Um, I am currently talking to a group of other booktubers who are also making plans to all kind of go over together. So it is a pretty serious thing. I do intend to go. The only reason I wouldn't go to New Zealand at this point after financially committing already is if kind of the bottom of my world fell out and there's no way to really predict if that'll happen or not. She also asks, how do you feel about travel in general after visiting Ireland? Any plans? I'm definitely more confident about traveling just in general since traveling to San Jose and to Ireland. Um, just, I'd never really done trips like that before and now that I've done them successfully and I've had so much fun and nothing really wrong has happened, I, I am definitely more confident. I would love to take some more short trips in the US, like domestically, I think I could really enjoy that now and it wouldn't stress me out too much. So I'd love to take some trips to see more family and friends and even flying if I needed to, that would be fine. Um, but really, really, I just wanna conquer New Zealand right now. <laughs> to go so far away successfully and enjoy myself, it, it will literally be the trip of a lifetime and I can't wait. All right, guys, that is the end of this Q&A. Once again, thank you so much for asking me so many great questions. Maybe I'll do another Q&A three years from now, maybe for like 10K if that were to ever happen. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed and I'll be back in your timeline tomorrow for another day of Vlogmas. I'm still pre-filming things today, so I don't really know what's happening or in what order, but I still hope you like it. So anyway, enough from me. I will talk to you again soon, and until then, bye.